and I'm moving the, uh, the electric water pump uh, temperature sensor back up to the right beside the, uh, the one that's already in the head for the ECU. It's too bad I can't share them, but they're thermistors and can't parallel them up between uh, computers. So I've just put this one in. So this is a busy little connector now. When it mounts, it's got uh, the um, overflow expansion tank connection, the radiator tank, the heater core, and now I've got this extra little temperature sensor in there. So uh, anyway, just cleaning up the O-ring surface and I'm going to put it back in right now. There you go. So by removing the temperature sensor, uh, underneath I had this adapter that the temperature sensor had put in place, so I've just installed a longer uh, AN20 uh, line to the uh, old water pump housing that has the impeller removed. So yeah, this whole thing works really well now. And uh, uh, engine temperature, I set it at 190, and uh, it held it absolutely at 190 at the uh, cylinder head, which is perfect, having the temperature sensor up top. So if I want to make maximum power, I could set that uh, at 160 or 170 and uh, for better, you know, engine wear and mileage set it at 190. So, yeah, this is good. So you guys know this glass has to all come out. So, I should say the Lexan has to come out, so as the stuff says. Motorsport plastic windows no longer. They'll have to all be removed. But look what I've got. <laughs> yes. It's the correct light green tint. And um, I don't actually mind um, having this little black trim around the inside edge because um, otherwise you can see through the front window and, uh, and see behind the molding a little bit. Uh, with the, the uh, Lexan front window now you can actually see the trim bits, it sort of drives me a bit nuts. Um, so yeah, I ended up getting this from a local auto supplier. It is uh, aftermarket glass, it's not OEM glass, but uh, I don't, not, nobody makes the original glass anymore. So um, light green tint as I said, I just want to show you, oh, the other thing is that the glass guys said, yeah, you know, don't use Windex, use this foaming glass cleaner, don't use nylon rope to put the gasket in, uh, use old cotton rope, uh, it's softer, it won't tear, and then this plastic tool uh, won't scratch the glass. Um, I'm just remediating some of the other original glass in here, so let's just turn the light on in here. So uh, there's the side windows. No major scratches in my original glass. You see it's slightly green, and if you actually look at the, the wording here, Oh, can't see it but it says tinted so they all have this little tint a tinted symbol um, printed on them or not symbol but actual words um, so I've got to remove the original film that was added by the previous owner and then I'm going to use cerium oxide and a felt pad um, to buff out all the fine scratches from the old glass and um, then install it and the only thing that's going to stay is my hatch at the back because carbon fiber, it's just too soft. I'll bust it if I have to take that uh, Lexan panel in and out. So the way I'm going to get the car certified is actually by uh, um, putting the old metal hatch back on with the old glass and then taking that off after I've, I'm certified. And I'll drive around with the Margard rear panel after that. Yeah, so just check the, because uh, I have this template left over from when I did the, uh, the Lexan. And I do have the other piece of glass, uh, it's just, it's cracked. Um, and this is uh, three quarters of an inch taller, top to bottom, and five eighths taller, well, wider than the other glass. So this is a glue-in, not a not the rubber gasket version. Um, it should work fine as a glue-in, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm happy with a glue-in. Um, not sure I, I'm going to do it myself. Maybe I'll get the glass guys to do it. Um, problem with the rubber gasket is the dash has to come back out to get this thing in. And I do not want to pull the dash part. It's just so much work. So this may be a blessing in disguise. Stay tuned on this one. So I'm now inside the car and uh, I'm doing frequency response 
uh, tuning on the um, system. So I've got a um, an IQ 1000.5 amp, uh, and it actually gives you a, a bunch of Bluetooth and uh, PC based. Uh, um, like I'm using actually a USB cable right now and talking to the amp directly using my laptop, but uh, you can also do this through your phone through Bluetooth wirelessly. So basically, what you got over here is a picture of the car, and I've just got uh, a subwoofer and then a mid base six and a half inch on each side in the door, and then the one inch tweeters. And uh, so starting at the top, so click on the tweeter. I've got the crossover set at 2500 hertz and I've done some frequency tuning already. I've got a little little dip that I've had to create uh, in the equalizer, this 31 band equalizer, uh, between about 3k and uh, 6-7k, just a couple decibels down to smooth it out there. And then on the mid bass, very strange looking, but what's going on here is they're mounted in the door and uh, mounted down low, so acoustically it's sort of in a weird place. Um, not much correction until you get above 100 hertz, and then you have to fill in up sort of the 6 to 10 decibel range, you know, down below middle C on the piano in that 200 to 500 hertz range, which is, you know, the second C uh, above, uh, the next C above middle C. So there's a there's a hollow spot there, and then there was a resonant peak um, at 500 hertz, where you know you're getting acoustic resonance. It's just coupling, and then again, I have to fill in the upper mid range, and that's probably because the uh, uh, this is for the most part this whole area is just the grill and the mounting muffling the mid frequencies before the crossover comes into effect. And the only reason why you're not having to fill in around the 500 hertz points is probably just because of a, a resonant peak in the uh, in the system. So, and then the subwoofer, uh, not really that important to to to, to equalize the subwoofer, but I've boosted it down in the 40, 20 to 40 hertz range, which is a seldomly used deep deep bass range. Reason uh, for a sub obviously is to just fill in the bottom two octaves or the bottom octave so I, I cross over my subs pretty low like at 70 hertz not not at 100 plus because that starts getting mid bassy and it can get kind of muddy um, so I'm the speakers in the doors are actually flat down to about 50 hertz anyway so I'm just wanting to fill in that area below 50 hertz and provide that very deep bass punch and in this case I used a sealed enclosure and the sealed enclosure is um, not going to give you as much of a linear bass response. It tends to drop off below 50 hertz on the sub, so I've had to increase up to 20 decibels down very deep. So what it, I'll just show you, I, I'll run this in a sec. This is my frequency response analysis software. It's called True RTA, and um, this is divided into one sixth octave bands, and I've got it pretty good now. Um, the, the human ear is really only able to hear plus minus three decibels, plus minus two decibels. I mean, tweaking down to the one decibel point is a waste of time in a car, for sure. In the home, maybe not so, but in a car, you know, ten decibels, you'll start to definitely hear a difference. So, right here, we're dealing in the mid-bass region, slight trough of maybe five decibels here that I'm still going to fill in. So, I pop back over to my tweak equalizer, go to my mid-bass, and then I start looking in that 100 to 200 hertz region, and I would go into the um, that area, and I would bring things up a couple decibels, and uh, take each of these sliders that I'm moving, and move them up a few dB, and on uh, both speakers, and and basically then have a look at it and see how how uh, how how we're doing. Ah, come on. And uh, it's hard to do this in the camera and the mouse at the same time. But basically, just move, move, move these panels up, and and see, and then it just compare it. Just make sure I, I got them both. Okay, so that one I got to move up a little bit. Um, are they the same? No, nope, the other one's got to come up a half decibel more. Oops, it's hard to do with the uh, trackpad. Um, but basically. Once you've done this, once you've moved these things up, then you're in a position to um, 
I'll just save it to a local file even though it's automatically taking effect right now I'll just save it and then I have to plug the microphone in and run a uh, so unplug the amp because I'm having to use the USB port for both of them plug my calibrated and I have a because I'm an audio engineer kind of on the part time thing that's my hobby is audio equipment so um, sorry it's falling down so this is this is a calibrated mic and I will run a uh, oh, let's see if I can uh, can I hold everything I gotta hold the mic I don't have a mic stand anyway um, I will show you without having this thing plugged in you can hear it when I click on this button here it'll do a frequency sweep you can just hear it very quickly right so that sound is from super low notes to the super high notes and then it it, it fills in and that's just picking up on the on the microphone <laughs> on the uh, the uh, lying on my lap so let me get this thing adjusted and uh, then it then it's done basically and I'll play it for you even though you probably won't be able to hear very well with these microphones on this camera but it uh, gives you an idea so it's a bit loud in here the pink noise I'm moving the microphone around and you can see it slightly changes the frequency response depending on where I move the microphone I move it over there to the speeder it goes up goes down so right where my head is I'm trying to make it as level as possible so it's pretty good where it is actually so I'm just Bluetooth streaming from uh, Spotify on my laptop here so just turning it off but basically I have to sort of one final decision is how much um, how hard do I want to drive the lower mid bass on these versus the subwoofer I may be pushing these ones a little bit hard right now uh, but this is a fairly bass heavy album so this is with no sub on it right now so no sub then I reach down here to turn the sub up it's just like a incredible sub looper I'm just not out sure how you can hear it but this uh, controller down here allows me to adjust the sub so I can decide how much I want to drive the, uh, how much I want to, as I said, drive the bass out of the sub and how much I want to drive it out of the mid bass and we'll see. It's, the whole car sounds awesome. From a sound system perspective, it's as good as I've ever achieved actually in any of my cars. So super happy with this little uh, GTI. You know, it's nice to be able to listen to the music and adjust the uh, frequency response at the same time, and so just I'm just listening to different music here, and it it turns out that it, even though I had a perfectly flat frequency response, I was had the feeling I was overdriving the mid bass a bit, as I was talking about earlier. Let's turn it down a bit here, and um, so I'm able to sort of just okay, fine, that's what the computer tells me to do, that's what the frequency response is, but then I can sit here and listen carefully to a range of music and then adjust it, so backed off the uh, the mid, mid bass a little bit, and uh, everything sort of fell into place, and it sounds very natural now, so I'm just listening to a range of music going, yeah, it's good. So, uh, and while I'm doing it, I'm calibrating my, my sensors so that all of my temperature sensors are all... <laughs> When the engine's cold, they're all reading the same temperature right now, so I'm sitting here just occasionally popping up the Holly management system and tweaking it while I'm listening to the music and relaxing, so it's kind of kind of nice to be at this phase of the project. So I'm just about to tore, tear these door cards off now and uh, start looking at putting in the glass. So anyway, the car looks nice now, but I'm going to have to take it apart. So these are left and right uh, Mark II mechanisms and uh, they've been modified to fit the door. Um, basically what I did is I took these flanges which are, they, they're a little bit 
too proud on the top. So these are the tops. All I did is I just cut the flanges and then just, you know, moved them down a little under a quarter of an inch maybe. And that gives me enough to uh, fit, uh, well, I'll show you here. They Basically the bolt holes, I think I showed you previously, the bolt holes will be right up here. And then the mechanism doesn't doesn't sit so far out, it comes back enough. So I've all got to get this regulators or the, uh, or the window glass holder piece. I've got to modify this because these two uh, things don't... Uh, don't line up. So a little work to do there as well but starting to rough it in and uh, then I can slam the glass in uh, this weekend and uh, zip it up and down. Hopefully it'll be pretty cool. I need a dual pull, dual throw, momentary uh, up down switch and uh, that'll, that'll work to get these motors to go up and down. All right, so I've got a test fit here. I've got the molding sort of in place, I guess, and the window, glass window, and the Mark II mechanism. So I've got uh, two holes here. I'm going to have to use some button heads, some very low profile uh, the M6 um, screws, and then at the bottom, same thing. Um, the motor, I'm going to have the motor over here. Hopefully I can get it to uh, to, to find a, a happy home somehow. It's very very close to the glass but um, we'll, uh, we'll fiddle with this a little bit to see how I position this thing exactly. Letting it dangle out here for now. Um, yeah, so I have a little battery. And which way are we going? We're going to go up first. So let me zoom out so you can see what's going on here all the way. And um, yeah, the bolts are not really, really tight yet, but and up we go. So it's up, and then I'll reverse the leads. And it goes down a lot faster, obviously. There's the mechanism down below. So the travel is nice. It drops just to the edge here and goes all the way up. So Mark II mechanism from a basic mechanical perspective works. If I can get the motor to go into the door without an interference fit, then this could end up being a successful deal. Um, a certain amount of fidgeting to get the alignment of everything just correct and I still have a little bit of tuning to do. I had to slot the holes a little bit to move the mechanism around to get it so that the mechanism itself is parallel to to the window and uh, so on. Anyway, it's look, looking good so far. So if you take the, there's a mounting plate. If you take that off, it'll set with you know only like about a millimeter to spare where the um, the lift channel goes it has to go by um, so what I'm thinking of doing is using maybe a couple of bolt holes here and just having a bracket that uh, goes across here and uh, and holds it in, in place and then it, and then it's good um, it fits doesn't fit with that bracket on it, but that bracket was meant to mount specifically to the Mark II. And uh, otherwise, you know, very, very fortunate it, it works. So I don't have a problem with the winder mechanism hitting the, um, the six and a half inch uh, mid woofer. And um, yeah, the only thing, I mean, I'd like to be able to use the, um, the original winder handle as a toggle switch. I just, there's there's nothing that I've been able to jury-rig or fiddle with yet. I, I really need a rotary, rotary um, dual-pull, uh, you know, uh, dual-throw momentary uh, rotary switch that I could 
machine something up so I, I'm gonna go for a simple uh, toggle that will mount in the hole with a little uh, bezel and it'll just up and down so a nice little plastic toggle um, make it try to look nice and clean have it key colored to the uh, color of the door maybe and um, maybe it'll look better in black I'm not sure but uh, it'll just be a little switch that you can just hit down hit up and up the door it goes so a little plastic paddle maybe so I've already ordered some switches I think will work um, <clears throat> so yeah this is this is gonna be really really good I'm super happy with the way this has progressed so I'm going to make that mounting bracket and um, disassemble the door and um, start polishing the glass and then when all the glass is done I'll, I'll do the second door and uh, put the uh, put everything in properly permanently um, I've got to go and re-prime and uh, fix all the holes that I've drilled and you know there's sort of hacked at this door a little bit more than I would have liked but uh, hey this is well worth it uh, getting a solution and uh, I don't really mind having electric windows in the car I kind of wanted roll-up windows but electric windows are going to be cool and I'm sure other people can use this uh, knowledge to uh, convert their Mark 1's to electric windows if they want because that's kind of a nice feature actually yeah so what I did is I ground, there's a lip on the back here and I ground it down between these two points so that I can strap this in place and then it uh, it works. I'll go down first. Let's see. Gotta reverse my leads. Go down. Goes down super fast. And then up. Yeah. So that's a good position for it. It works. I'll have to put some felt in and um, some felt and some rubber just make sure this is just exactly the right angle when it's strapped in permanently and put some felt in behind it so that if the window mechanism rubs against it there's no rattling and uh, it's gonna work it's excellent